Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Investor Lab. And joining me today on today's podcast uh, was a guy named Sean McGeckin. Now, Sean is a 30-year-old barista who has started his property investing journey by investing internationally. You know, his very first property that he ever bought was in New Zealand. And he's and he's seeking to continue to grow his property portfolio internationally. So I think this conversation is really interesting for a number of reasons. You know, we talk about the value of mindset. We talk about the value of uh, investing in yourself. And we also talk about why he's seeking to invest internationally, what his biases are around that. And not only that, it's very interesting to get the perspective of someone who is working as a barista and is also managing to, you know, invest internationally and to continue to pursue that path. Now he's on track and he has a desire to achieve financial independence in the next three years. And what you'll hear when we go through this conversation is that the the dialogue and the mindset is strong. And I think listening to this episode is going to be it's going to really bed in the importance of having a solid focus, a solid mindset, and a, and a big why, which Sean definitely definitely has. We touched on a lot of different things, you know, you know, the, the cost of investing internationally, what to look for, what Sean's strategy is, and so much more. So this episode is going to be awesome if you're just starting your property journey, if you're in the early phases, you know, in the sort of like one to three range, or even if you have even if you've got more properties and you've been thinking about investing overseas and wondering like, okay, how does it work and all that kind of stuff? We touched on a lot of things in here. So I'm super excited for you to get into it. Now, if you need help, we as as I say, we talked a lot about investing internationally, New Zealand, UK, all this kind of stuff. But of course, if you need help to build a property portfolio in Australia that not only grows in value, but you know produces net positive income and allows you to build a truly scalable property portfolio, please make sure you reach out to us. Just head to dashdot.com.au forward slash discovery. And you can book in a time with me or the team and we can have a little chat and understand a little bit about where you are and help to help you get from where you are to where you want to be. And that would be an absolute pleasure to get to know you a little bit better. But in the meantime, if you're not ready to do that, that's totally cool. That's totally awesome. But what I would ask is if you're enjoying this episode and, and all of the other episodes that we Produce, which we love doing because our passion is helping people just like you to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And if you're enjoying that journey, then make sure you hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It means a lot to us. It helps us to rise up the rankings. More people learn about it. Wonderful. And, and if you think this episode is great or this show is good, we'd love for you to help us get it out to more people to help more people just like you. And you can also do that by sharing it with a friend or a family member or a loved one, posting about it on you know, social media, doing any of that kind of stuff. It all adds up and it really, really helps. And of course, if you have any feedback and you want to let us know, you know what you think about it or if you have any suggestions of stuff you'd like us to cover, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. You can just email us at hello at dash.com.au. We welcome and we love hearing from all of you guys. So many thanks and I look forward to seeing you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to the Investor Lab. Joining me today is Sean McGeckin. Now, I've had the pleasure of knowing Sean, uh, you know, through the through the internet, through the wonders of the of cyberspace uh, over this past probably twelve months or so. And I got to say, it's got a very interesting, not only perspective on investing, but also uh, story, which I'm 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 lucky enough to know, and I'm very excited to to dig into that today. Sean, how are you? You're really well, mate. Thank you. How are you, mate? I'm very well. I'm very well. So. Look, I want to kick things off. As 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 you know, the the function of these episodes is really to, you know, dig into your story, understand, you know, how where you're at, how you've gotten to where you're going, what challenges you face, all of that kind of stuff, so that we can kind of inspire others to 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 take action and to overcome any challenges they may face. So why don't we kick it off by getting a little bit of a backstory on on you? Like, how old are you? Where do you currently live? What do you do? All of that kind of stuff. Right, so I am 30 years old. I am currently working as a barista, as I have for the last 16 years, uh, and I live in Melbourne. So I work out of a little cafe in Gardenvale, the only cafe in Garden. Uh, nice. I've been there for eight years now. Okay, awesome. So, right, so you're 30 years old, you're a career barista, uh, you're 16 years as a barista, and you're in Melbourne, so you've had to get, you've had to, you've had to do all that through all of the um, shutdowns and all of that kind of stuff. So, tell us a little bit about your portfolio. Let's get stuck into it because I want to start picking that apart because I think there's going to be some interesting, interesting stuff to learn here. Tell, give us a very high level overview on what your personal property portfolio looks like right now. So, currently, the 
portfolio looks like one property in New Zealand. So okay. it's in a town called uh, Wanganui. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, and when did you buy that one? Uh, May 2019. Awesome. Okay, cool. So you're 30 years old. You're a career barista. You bought a property in New Zealand. You live in Melbourne. Why did you buy in New Zealand? A few reasons. One, I didn't quite have enough cash to buy at the time uh, what I knew to be a property in Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, New Zealand has no stamp duty, which was a massive, massive, massive plus side for us, uh, for me. And the capital gains tax, they do have it, but it's set at 0%. Sorry, can I say that again? So they have capital gains tax, but it's set at 0%. Correct. So technically no capital gains tax. They do have, they do have something called the bright line test. So if you sell the property as an external investor within the first five years, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who is investing in New Zealand, uh, you will be a further tax on that. Okay. Interesting. So that is sort of a capital gain. Okay. So how much did you pay for that property in Wanganui? $165,000. $165,000. $165,000. $165,000. Tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about that. How much did it cost you to get into it? What's the what was the strategy behind it? What's the year? Tell us a little bit about this property that you bought. So it's a little three bed, not little. It's a three bedroom house on a 650 meter block. Yep. Um it cost us 49,500 to get into. Mm-hmm. Uh you know in, if you put on legal fees and stuff it was more like 55. Yep. And all that other excess jargon. Uh, it required a facelift, so I went in or had a builder go in and do uh, some cosmetic renovations. So we've done all new kitchen because it was basically functionless. Yeah. Uh, new floors, paint the whole thing, and just make it look like a good, clean rental unit. Uh, all said and done, I overcapitalized a little bit on that reno, so we spent twenty-eight. I think it was. Could have done it for 15, but in the long term, because I'm not going to get rid of this thing, uh, everything's going to be long-term buy and hold. So spend more now, pay less later. Okay. So what's the LVR on that property? Uh, 70%. 70%. Was that a function of you needing to buy? Because you're because you're in Australia and you were buying in New Zealand, was that a function of that? Like, did you have to, is there a reason at 70%? And, and why didn't you seek higher leverage? It is because I'm an outside investor. So they'll mainstream banks will only do 70% LVR. Uh, Second tier, I think now we'll go to 80. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. And did you, did you, did you invest in that property by yourself or did you do it with other people? Uh, So it's with my fiance. Awesome. Great. Awesome. What does your fiance do? Yeah. Uh, She's a property stylist. Great. So she's only just been able to go back to work with the lockdowns. Awesome. Oh, well, that'd be very handy when you start buying properties in Australia, right? Very. Yeah, she's <laughs> very keen to get into it. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm very interested to understand your pathway, right? So not a lot of people start their property investing journey by investing in a different country. <laughs> now, I, I, I happen to know that you've got one of the most, I, I would say, the most internationally aspirational portfolio. Now you've only got one property, I get it. But you and I have had a lot of dialogue around investing in the UK, investing in the US. You've obviously invested in New Zealand. I'm interested to understand what is the pathway that led to this property, right? Because for I would say for a lot of people, and I say this with no level of uh, disrespect or whatever, a lot of people think that property investing is only for, for people that have got, you know, high paying jobs and all of this kind of stuff. And it's, and it's kind of like, it's, it's another person's game. And I think it's one of the things that stops people getting into it, which I, I disagree with for a start, but you've managed to save enough money with your fiance to do it. You're uh, as a barista, you know, you're, you're not like a hedge fund manager or anything like that, but not only that, you actually didn't even do it in Australia. You went and did it overseas. I'm very interested to understand the pathway that got you to that point. Yeah. Right. So we reached that port had seminars pop up in Melbourne four or five times a year. Yeah. Um, we were just happening to be doing a lot of road trips at the time. So going to Ballarat, going to Geelong, looking at properties, doing the whole, what can we find locally? And, 
And because we were so amped up about it, I said, why don't we just go check out this, you know, free two hour seminar. So I did that, uh, saw some examples of what could be do- done in uh, New Zealand specifically. And from there, that led to a three day seminar where, you know, the whole thing's just to build up hype, 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 hype for their, their uh, big sale product at the end, which was a three day mentorship in well, obviously New Zealand and the UK. Uh, I decided to split towards New Zealand because the UK one was like $70,000. Didn't want to spend that much on three days of education. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, ended up in New Zealand, spent three days there with a mentor and then a further week uh, in a location that I was fully prepared to buy property in. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to go too much into any per- personal details here, but I'll, 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 I'm interested to to understand this. I think this would be really an interesting thing for people, other people to understand as well. So, firstly, I just want to point out that that with me and Gabby, our property, our real property journey kind of started in the same way with one of those two hour rich dad poor dad free seminars. We, we'd actually just bought a property that was the wrong property, the wrong place, wrong time, and then literally we, we were rushing to sign the contracts. So funny, we were rushing to sign the contracts because we were running late for one of these two hour free rich dad poor dad seminars and as soon as we'd signed the contract we it was our first ever property it was an off the plan apartment you know like all of the all of the stuff you shouldn't buy and uh, and we were like quick quick oh come on enough chit chat come on sign the contracts and we jumped in the car and we raced towards this seminar in melbourne and we had a, a celebratory halal snack pack in the car that was our celebratory we just bought a property dinner we get into we get into the we get into the the two hour seminar and they start talking about things like positive cash flow and all of this stuff and we're like Ooh, hang on a second. We may have made a little. We may have made a little error here with our property purchase. So I've gone through that process um, too. Now we didn't do any of the mentorships. I'm curious though, and again, I don't want to dig into. You can, you know, don't have to divulge anything. The UK program was seventy grand. Yep. You bought a property in Wanganui um, that cost you fifty five grand to get into it. Yep. How? What was the investment to do? You don't have to. You can don't have to go into specifics, but like when you factor in the, the, the mentorship program or the, or the, all of the costs of doing that to get into a property overseas, what did that, like, what's the total kind of capitalization to get into that property? Uh, so if we, if we include the property purchase into that whole capitalization, mm. I think we've probably spent uh, about a hundred. Interesting. Because splitting from the UK and New Zealand package, just going to New Zealand saves I think it was, I think twenty eight five is what I spent. Okay, on that. But uh, hands down, I still think it's the best money I've ever spent. Yeah, because like, and it's not to discredit any of that because, and and look, you know, a lot of people have had mi- mixed experiences with um with different education seminars and stuff, and 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 specifically even the rich dad poor dad type thing. But at the end of the day, the investment is not in the property; it's in the education, right? So exactly. So okay. So you invested in your education. You spent about, we'll call it 30 grand to, to upskill and educate. Do you think that those skills that you learned are transferable outside of New Zealand? 100%. Okay. Um, so I've used, or well, I've not used them like physically yet, but I can now basically do most of the, if not all of the due diligence on any property anywhere. Awesome. So it's just about learning to apply what you already know. Yeah. I think um, I'm interested in your perspective on this as well, but I think that, that, that 90% of any of it is mindset, right? If you can understand how to think, how to think about something, then you can kind of apply the, the thinking anywhere. If you can learn how to think on a principles level. I'd say it's a hundred percent mindset. Like if your mind's not in it one day, you, you're going to make a mistake. Yeah. It's just what happens. So it's, you don't have to be there. 100% hardcore all the time. But while you're sitting down running numbers, looking at a property, you've got to be there. Yeah. You can't be off at work. You can't be in the garden. You've got to be in that property for at least five minutes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what? tell me then, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned through the whole process of, uh, you know, because you went to New Zealand, you did a mentorship program, you learned all this stuff, you went to Wanganui, you found a property, you bought the property, you overcapitalized on it, but it, you're, you're still happy. What's the biggest lesson that you learned through that whole process? I didn't actually end up in Wanganui 
just so we know, I ended up in Gisborne ah. and then the Gisborne market rose and I went to, I, uh, I found a property in Wanganui. So I haven't even been there. I've never seen it. I've never been to Wanganui. Okay, cool. So you went to Gisborne, sussed out Gisborne, came back to Australia and then bought a property somewhere else. Is that right? Exactly. Okay, yeah. cool. Awesome. Yeah. Good, good. Um, the biggest lesson yep. is communication with your team. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have really good communication and everything that is said to be done with the property has to be in writing. So mm-hmm. there's got to be a paper trail, even if it's a simple email you can refer back to. Is that, is, are you saying that based on a situation you had or what, what, why is that a lesson that you've learned? Yeah, yes and no. It wasn't a massive issue or turned out not to be a massive issue, but my, uh, my keys went missing for two days between the exchange of the property manager and the builder. Mm. And that was just a, a lack of communication between the manager and the builder. Uh, so what happened was renovations are starting, builder needs keys, obviously. Uh, property manager puts the keys in the letterbox of a house he's actually working on, tells the apprentice, not the builder. The apprentice obviously gets distracted and doesn't tell anyone. And then two days later, I call the builder, right, you're in, great. And he's like, I haven't got the keys. So that's a lot of toing and froing from me freaking out. Um, but yeah, in the end, it was just a minor communication error. And I, that day I instated a face-to-face handover. Awesome. So I don't care if it takes an extra five days, you will hand the keys to the builder. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. Okay. So you bought that property. This, that's a good, that's a good lesson for people to think about as well, particularly when they're going to be, uh, you know, we, we, we passionately advocate, you know, investing outside of your own backyard. And so whether it is in, in New Zealand or whether it is, whether you're in Melbourne and you're investing in, in WA or whether, whether you're in New South Wales and you're investing in South Australia, you know, I would say that out of our clients, I think 99% of our clients have never seen the properties that we've bought for them. Yeah, it may be higher than 99%. And so I think understanding these lessons uh, translate uh, and transmute whether it's international or interstate investing anyway. So tell me then, how's the property performed since you bought it? Yes. It's just, it's cash flowing away nicely. Twice a month, they get paid by the, by the manager and it's just ticking away. Awesome. Okay, cool. So what's next then? So you've got this one property in Wanganui. Now what? Next up is a second property in New Zealand. Uh, COVID put a little bit of a dampener on that because the banks and lenders don't, didn't really like the job keeper payment that my fiance was on, mm-hmm. even though we were making more money at the time, which, you know, great. I would, if I had had it again, I wouldn't like to make more money. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those things. I feel bad about it, but you know, there you go. Uh, so yes, that I sent off to the mortgage broker a payslip because she's no longer on JobKeeper, a payslip and a, writ, a letter from her boss saying she's no longer JobKeeper. Yep. So looking to get a refinance to buy another one or at least be under contract by the end of the year. Yep. Uh, and then next year, um, we're moving into the UK market. And, and if I can get my shit together, pardon the language, I know, Family friendly show, um, uh, Australia as well. Okay, cool. So let's talk about that. What, what, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do in New Zealand? Is it going to be the same or different? Why, why do you want to go into the UK market next? And why is it Australia after that? Right. So New Zealand's going to be much the same because uh, I'm still in the building phase. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be another uh, single family residence on a block of land large enough to add a minor dwelling. Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to affect it once I own 10 properties, I want to turn that to 20 just by adding minor dwellings. When you say minor dwelling, do you mean a granny flat or do you mean building, building another house? You mean like doing a subdivision and building another yeah. house or what's the, what do you mean? Depending on the size of the block, subdivision is a thing, but it's probably going to be more like a two bedroom unit. So granny flat style, except you can have a, you know, a, a small family. Yeah. Okay, cool. And would that be on a separate title? Is that what the process is? Or are you just thinking it's on the same title, separate leases? What's, what's the thinking? Uh, 
if I can subdivide, it'll be a separate title. If not, it'll just be the same title with a separate lease. Okay, awesome. So you're going to buy, so basically you're going to rinse and repeat uh, in New Zealand. You're going to do pretty much the same thing and buy something that you can add, add value to later on. So you kind of, what, what, do you know where you're going to buy in New Zealand? Uh, not a clue. Awesome. So it's wherever the numbers work. If the numbers work again in Wanganui, great. If not, it could be, you know, in the cargo, it could be what, Gisborne, what, I don't know. What numbers do you look at specifically? Like how do you define whether the numbers work? Is it purely just on a yield play or what's the, what's the verdict on that? Like how do you define that? Yep. Yield definitely comes into it. It's a big part of why I'm investing. But my other goals are I'd like to be able to refinance the property and recycle the entire deposit onto the next one. So there's got to be, it's got to be under market value enough or there's got to be enough growth in that market to be able to do minor facelift, bring that value up and then recycle out the deposit and do it again. Okay, cool. So you're kind of ticking all the holy trinity boxes there, right? So you want, exactly. to, buy, yeah, yep. you, you want to get growth, either manufactured or market, right? And you want the ability to add value and you want a good yield. So you have cash flow positive, high growth area, value add potential. Sounds good. All right. Exactly. Yep. Okay, cool. Got that. So why, why, uh, the, why the UK? Why do you want to go there? So the UK, I want to go there, uh, particularly cemented now because of COVID. They have the most amazing social housing. Mm. So effectively for a landlord, that means guaranteed rent. The council is actually a tenant, not the tenant. Uh, and they've got such an old housing market that there's not a lot of space for new houses in certain yeah. areas. And the population is so dense that there's so there's lots of renters. Okay, so how are you going to do that? Like, are you going to go to the UK yourself? What's how? What's how are you? How are you going to do that? Oh, look, eventually I'll go to the UK. Uh, but I've actually done that through another mentorship. Nowhere near as expensive as the first one. Okay, good. Which is great, and it's <laughs> uh, it's it's also been good because it's all online. Yep. So it's spaced over six months. So we'll do a less than a month. And so far it's been incredible. Awesome. But we've got lots of background knowledge. We're setting up companies and stuff in the next couple of months and then we'll be ready to buy hopefully early 2021. Awesome. Sounds good. What, what's the best investment you've made so far? I would say probably the mentorship. Which one? The, like that the, that the, initial the... New Zealand mentorship. Awesome. Just because it's allowed me to move on to do the UK stuff, to get, to be confident enough to, with the Australian side of things, I'd like to bring family into it. So treat it like a family business so we can all benefit. Um, and I'm confident that with what I've learned, I can help essentially. I'm curious why you, you obviously don't value the Australian market the same way you value international markets. Otherwise you'd be seeking to invest in Australia sooner. Why is that? It's not that I don't value the Australian market. It's just that I think because I have lived here my whole life, I've got that. It's been drummed into me the whole bias for the first 25 years, the whole negative gearing nonsense. I've still got that stuck in the back of my head. So I'm, it's not that I don't value the Australian market. It's just that I find it more of a, a growth asset and the cash flow works a lot better in New Zealand and the UK from what I've seen. Okay. But so, I've also done a lot more research in the UK and okay. New Zealand. Okay, cool. I mean, I, I, would, I would agree. I would agree that, the, that, that you can probably get better cash. Pro, again, not exclusively because it depends on Australia is a big country. So you can buy properties for- Exactly. You know, sub two hundred thousand dollars that get eight nine percent yield. You can absolutely do that in in Australia, and we've actually done that for clients. So that so the, it, you know that that's that to me is a relative moot point. I would agree um, more broadly if we look at that, like just on a broad brushstroke sense, Australia is more of a growth market than New Zealand or or the UK. Again, that's not an absolute. That's just a very like broad brushstroke view, but. Don't you think growth is important? Oh, 100% growth is important. 100%. But 
But from where I started, uh, not knowing you and Gabby, not knowing anything about the market except for, you know, Ballarat didn't work very well. Geelong didn't work very well. Bendigo probably did work very well, but I didn't go there. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. New sec. Zealand worked extremely well. Hang, hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second. Ballarat didn't work very well. Geelong didn't work very well. What do you mean didn't work very well? Because I know well, I personally know people who've gotten double digit growth in those markets and also, yes. and, and, um, and also had positive cash flow properties. So on what basis did you judge that they don't work? I judged it on the basis just of the properties I saw. So for me personally, the things I saw, I didn't know how to run numbers properly. I didn't know how to do proper research. Mm. Um. And what I learned in New Zealand was that you could get like 10 to 20% yields on these property with 10 to 20% growth. So at the time when I was doing my research and stuff, that piqued my interest. So I pushed more towards that. All right. Tell me then, what's the yield on the property in Wanganui? Uh, It's 10.6 net at the moment per month. 10.6 uh, yeah. 10. 6, 10. 6 net. So that's, so just to clarify, yes. is that net including uh, property management rates, council, bill, any like fully, fully, fully? Everything. Yeah, fully what, net. What's the gross yield on it? Uh, I haven't calculated that since I first did it. Okay. Wait on. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm genuinely interested. I, the other perspective that I want to, I, I want to ask is, for you, why is cash flow more important than growth? Because I would my my, my viewpoint, and again, it's just my, my personal viewpoint, is that in the earlier phase, I think the cash flow ultimately is the most important part of a property portfolio. But in the earlier phases, when you're in the accumulation phase, if you don't get the capital growth, then you're going to limit your ability to generate the capital required to build the portfolio that's going to pay you money. So how have you balanced that that perspective between cash flow and growth as well? First, first, the first, the gross yield on that property, and second, that question. <laughs> well, I'll do the second question first because I have uh, I got distracted by talking. Um, <laughs> balance was the reason I was looking for cash flow was because I am a barista. My wage is quite low, which means I can't service quite as much, and because this is yielding so high, that's helping the uh, serviceability for the next loan. Yeah. So even after I pull out everything, it'll still be paying me like $300 a month. So that's a a big bonus and that's just going to keep building. Um, In terms of coupling that with the growth using like essentially what is the Holy Trinity strategy, that's where I'm heading with that. So buying something that's going in a growing area, it's going to appreciate. So we're going to be able to use that growth as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, we're using you know, COVID as an example, Wanganui is a big town. Like currently there's about 42,000 people living there. They're estimating that because people are moving back from the major cities to live in the regions again, they're estimating a 50,000 people population, I think by the end of next year, maybe end of two years. I may have that wrong, Um, but it's growing and there's not a lot of housing. So that's increasing the demand which in turn is driving the price up in most most areas. Not all areas, though. Yeah, not all areas. There are areas, I don't know, recently, I don't know whether you saw the, um, there was news about a smelter in Invercargill. Not a smelter, it, what was it? It's like aluminium plant in Invercargill. They were shutting down. That caused a bit of a hubbub in some of the forums I was in, but since then, um, that's it's all calmed down because I think somebody's going in and they're going to continue to use it. Mm-hmm. And so they was going they were going to lose like thousands of jobs in that one area. It would have been that probably would have been Sanjeev Gupta going up buying all the metal plants. He's uh, he's he, he pretty much if there's a if there's a metal smelter in the world that's up for sale, Sanjeev Gupta seems to go and buy it. So I wouldn't doubt that. So, okay, all right, uh, okay, I mean. I mean, just did you work out the gross yield on that property? I'm very curious because that's peaked. That's peaked my interest. Ten, 10 plus net is. Uh, I, I think that's an exciting prospect, uh, particularly if people can do that. Uh, and I always like to try and uh, take take the lens of what what works in other markets, and then go how do we do that in Australia? 
whilst you're working that out, because I'll just share my my kind of my train of thought. So where how we sort of got to the Holy Trinity initially was after we bought the wrong property, wrong place, wrong time, went to go went to do the free two hour seminar, then ended up going to the three day seminar. And we did, we did, we like you, we invested deeply in education. We've done, we've done pretty much if there's a property course out there, we've probably uh, had a had a stab at it. Um the thing that the thing that kind of got me is we were looking like that particular program, which talked about, you know, high yield, high growth, the ability to add value essentially is what the premise was or I'm buying under market purported that that was only achievable overseas. And that got me really thinking because I was like, surely, surely we could actually, what if we could find it in Australia? Wouldn't that be a lot easier and better? And that's actually what what led us down the pathway to develop the Holy Trinity. And it, it pretty much was the foundation of, of what we're doing now. Because I was like, well, if you, if why can, can, can it be done in Australia? And if it can be done in Australia, why wouldn't we do it in Australia? And that's kind of what, what led us to, to be better than here. But I always do like to look overseas and go, okay, well, what's working over there? Uh, and how can that be applied here? You know, like look, thinking about multifamily, you know, homes and all of that kind of stuff and taking some of those, those thinkings and bringing them to Australia. How did you get, how did you go with that yield? Uh, it's coming at 11.34 gross. 11. Whether that's right or not. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, we we may need. Right, we'll we'll come back to that. I'll put it in the I'll put it in the show notes because I think that <laughs> yeah, I, we'll, we'll we'll recalculate that I, after the show. I have to read my maths. It's early. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, okay. It's, it's 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 six in the morning. We're not going to hold you to that, but that's okay. What um, what advice do you have to other people who might be in a similar part part of their journey, or maybe just before you in their journey? What advice would you have to them about um? you know, getting into the market, getting started, like how, how would you, how would you share your knowledge with other people now in a way that might benefit them? Yeah. Um, firstly, I think it's important to know what you want and why you want to do it. Uh, so the why is arguably more important than the what, and that'll help you find out how to do it. And I think the best way to do it is just to invest in yourself. Like, don't necessarily buy the mentorship, but at least go to the, go to the seminar. Um, if they're anything talking about property, you know, engage with investing communities. The more people you talk to, the more you're going to learn, and just generally surround yourself with what you want to do or who you want to be. So, for instance, I now have I would consider three. So I would consider you. Uh, a mentor goose. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, so three property mentors, you know, one in the UK, one in New Zealand, one here, but there's, and filtering down from that so many more friends in the investing community now. And even though I've only just started really. Interesting. Okay. What's your why? Uh, well, time essentially. Uh, nine years ago when I was 21, my dad passed away at 49 um, and he worked six days a week for my entire life. We had one day together as a family and that was a Sunday. And when I got a job, what day did I work? Sunday. So essentially what I want to do and why I'm doing this is to buy back my time. So the goal is, it's an ambitious goal. I don't want to have to work in three years. So I want that to be an option. And how 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 likely do you think that is from where you are right now? From the from what, if you just stand where you are in the in the cosmos and and look outward, how how likely do you think that is? Probably I'm sitting at about eighty five percent. I just got to get off my ass and do it. So it's just constant, repeatable action. Awesome, awesome. I love that. I love that. Have you got any questions for me before we wrap it up? Uh, not really. Awesome. No. Matt, I think I've asked all the questions. <laughs> Matt, I've really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's um I think it's uh deeply insightful. What happened with it? What happened? What about the US? Because you were talking about investing in the US for a while. Still to come. <laughs> I got I'll wrap up I'll wrap up the UK first. Um, and then Australia, so don't, don't forget. Don't sorry, for, sorry, yes, don't and forget Australia. about Australia. <laughs> Australia, I've, re- I've got to write a brief so I can sell it to the family because they're all a lot more cautious than I am. 
So I want to try and figure out how to get them all on board and be not necessarily comfortable, but more comfortable with the idea of it. So Kim, just on that, are you, are you doing all of this as a, like a family investment process or is this just you? It, like with all of the international stuff, is this you and your family or is it like I'm doing all the international stuff and then when it comes to Australia, I'm going to do that as a family joint venture? So look, international stuff at the moment is just me. I would love to bring the family in on it. But again, as I said, they're a lot more cautious. So they want to see lots of proof, whereas they're, they're comfortable in Australia. So they're happy to... I think they'd be more happy to start here and then branch out from there. Mm. Whereas I'm, you know, I can start anywhere and branch out from there. And yeah. who doesn't love global income? Well, I don't know. There's questions to be asked about that. Why would you want global income? I mean, I, I you know, isn't there more taxes? How do you get the money back? Doesn't it overcomplicate things? No, it's just, just as many questions as there is answers, right? That's true, but you don't have to bring the money back. So why? You why just why, keep it there and... Yeah. So and okay. spend it. why would you, yeah. so if I could generate $50,000 passive income in the UK, but I wanted to live in Australia and never go to the UK, why would I want to do that? Why wouldn't you get paid in pounds, not dollars? Yeah. But so you would just spend it from your UK bank account. Yeah. True. So you're still, you're still going to, you're still going to be, you're still going to be, you know, transacting internationally, but no, I, I, I can, depends on what you're spending it on, I guess. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And he says there is, there is tax agreements between, you know, country of residence and tax residency, but, you know, pay tax locally and then deal with the rest later. Sweet. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, mate, I think this has been really insightful. I think, uh, I think it's definitely brought a different uh, perspective to the investing conversation. I think this has been a really valuable uh, contribution to the Investor Lab community. So thanks so much for your time. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Just get into it. Stop thinking about it and do it. Awesome. On that note, we'll see you guys on the next episode.